Welcome to the World Bank Praxis Discussion Series. I'm Oscar Sabakti. I'd like to welcome our audience here in Sydney and those watching on APAC online and listening on radio and everyone watching in Dili, Honiara and Port Moresby. And now we're also being streamed live online. Just visit live.worldbank.org to watch and ask a question and you can follow the discussion on Twitter using the Pacific Praxis hashtag. Well, as one of the most dispersed regions in the world, the Pacific faces unique challenges in providing affordable and accessible electricity, with a heavy reliance on diesel fuel generators to power homes and businesses. Electricity prices in the region are among the highest in the world, with some countries spending as much as a quarter of their gross domestic product on fuel imports. To mitigate this exposure, Pacific governments are increasingly turning to alternative energy sources, including biofuels, wind, solar and hydro systems. As negotiations at the COP21 climate change talks in Paris continue, what actions are being taken in the Pacific to increase the uptake of renewables? Are new technologies even worth investing in? And what role should development partners play? Well, joining us to discuss these issues and more are Kamleshwa Kalawan, Senior Energy Specialist at the World Bank here in Sydney, Paul Fulton, Manager of the Dual Logic in Hobart, Andrew Ducker, Executive Director of the Pacific Power Association in Suva, and Matthew Dornan, Research Fellow at the Australian National University in Canberra. Thank you all for joining us today. Well, firstly, I thought I'd uh, ask you to paint us a picture. And Matthew, if I could start with you. In your role at the Australian National University, you, your research uh, has been um, drawn on widely um, in terms of renewable energy in the Pacific. Can you just give us a description of what energy is being used and where exactly? Well, I guess overall the Pacific um, remains very reliant on fossil fuels. So most Pacific Island countries rely almost exclusively uh, on diesel generators, uh, on um, oil-fired generation for their electricity supply. Uh, there are some exceptions, uh, Fiji for example, uh, Samoa, uh, PNG, uh, but certainly for, for most of the Pacific um, that statement is true. The issue in the Pacific is that um, these countries uh, don't produce um, fossil fuels. As a result, all fossil fuels are imported in the region. Uh, fossil fuel uh, power generation tends to be expensive and of course it exposes uh, Pacific Island countries to oil price volatility. And Cam, as we've seen, energy access rates are quite low relative to the rest of the world. Now, why is this and how can renewable energy be the answer to this? I think uh, in the Pacific, uh, one of the reasons why energy access is so low is because of the weak capacity in the government, both in terms of planning and implementation of programs. The other reason is that the Pacific Islands are generally dispersed small island islands in small load centers. The economies of scale do not exist, so it's very difficult to get out there and get energy available to the communities uh, in the Pacific. As an example, I mean, the land mass in the Pacific is about the size of New Zealand, and that's spread over 15 percent of the world's total area. So it is quite a challenge to get energy out there. And finally, I think the main challenge for the governments is that they need access to finance. And I think taking all that into account and the type of solutions that can work for these remote dispersed uh, communities is renewable energy. And I think there is a lot of opportunity for renewable energy to be deployed in these smaller load centers and to increase access levels for these uh, communities. Andrew, uh, you're from one of the Pacific's largest bodies representing energy suppliers in the region. Is there a push among the, the utility companies to, to um, develop renewable energy and why is there this push? The, um, the Pacific Island utilities uh, that are members of the, uh, my organisation are 80% owned by the by the national governments. Uh, the national governments have um, recognized the need to uh, um, accelerate the, um, the integration of renewable energy and increase the capacity in uh, renewable energy. Um, mostly um, 
for um, purposes of um, uh, lessening the, the impacts of uh, fuel price fluctuations uh, impacting on the islands. Uh, there is a lot of push now within the Pacific Island countries to, uh, to do so and, and um, it's, it's one of the reasons why the Pacific have engaged uh, um, uh, development partners and other organizations in, in, in uh, developing renewable energy uh, programs uh, for the Pacific Island countries uh, mainly to, to be able to uh, uh, lessen the impact of fuel, fuel price fluctuations. And, uh, the the climate change um, um, climate change uh, benefits are uh, and the actions that the governments are taking are as as a symbolic uh, gesture from the, from the Pacific Island countries in in, in being able to do um, something although they do not emit em, emit the uh, high levels of uh, climate uh, greenhouse gas emissions but being able to, to say we are impacted by these uh, climate change uh, changes and although we are not uh, emitting that uh, much, we, this is what we can do in terms of uh, um, renewable energy and, and renewable energy does that for the Pacific Island countries. So that's interesting because I think many of us would associate renewable energy sources as a way to address climate change issues but in, in the case of Pacific Island nations it's, it's more a necessity. So you're saying that uh, there's a focus on renew renewables to avoid uh, price hikes and price volatility. Yes, uh, and, and based on experience and, and, and the, 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 the events of 2008 in some of the Pacific Island countries where they've had to declare a state of emergencies because they do not have the resources to be able to buy fuel um, for um, diesel generation just simply because of the fact that price was uh, no longer um, affordable. Uh, so it's more to to be able to uh, have um, uh, that uh, in place rather than the, the climate change issues. Mm. So more stability and sustainable access to power. Yes. Okay, Paul, if I could now turn to you. You're an independent power producer in the Pacific. Uh, can you first tell us uh, what, what sort of, um, uh, I guess, uh, what structures do you have in place in the Pacific and why you entered it? Uh, Oscar, um, I do have, um, I am an independent power producer. We don't actually have any facilities operating in the Pacific at the moment. Uh, some of the key barriers for IPPs, independent power producers in the Pacific, are that um, renewable projects are typically highly capital intensive and um, there's a lot of fluctuation associated with the with the price of diesel so what they're competing against um, so to get the certainty for an investor to come into the Pacific they really need we, we've all heard the term feeding tariffs or or some stability associated with and certainty associated with the price that they will achieve for the energy that they export to the grid um, they also need uh, some certainty on being able to dispatch the energy that is generated by the device, whether it's solar or wind or other renewable energy sources such as biomass into the network. With small networks quite often there are constraints on generation when the load and the generation are out, out of balance. So there are, there are key things, key, key risks associated with um, for an IPP that make it, um, that can be overcome and it, but the structures are quite often not there to, to enable that high capital investment in renewable energy systems. And we'll take a, a closer look at the obstacles and the solutions, but uh, before we do, uh, have those obstacles prevented you from entering the market? Uh, absolutely, yes. If we look at the, this concept of renewable energy targets, because many um, nations in the Pacific have them in place. Um, Samoa uh, has quite an ambitious one. that They want to go 100% renewable by 2017, so in a couple of years' time. Matthew, from your research, are targets like Samoa's realistically achievable and um, what is the current rate of uh, renewable energy uptake? Um, 
It's hard to answer that for the Pacific as a whole. Uh, the answer really depends on the country um, which you're considering. Uh, in some cases, uh, Fiji, for example, uh, high targets are absolutely appropriate. Um, Fiji has a wide range of renewable energy resources that can be developed at low cost and can provide electricity at a cost below the alternative, which is uh, diesel generators, or oil-fired generation. Um, that said, uh, there are also very ambitious targets in countries like Tuvalu, like Nauru, uh, which don't have those uh, low-cost renewable energy resources. So in those cases, I think uh, achieving the, the targets that they've set will be much more difficult, uh, will be much more costly, uh, will certainly depend on development finance. Um, and really, I, I think that those targets are, uh, are set at the political level. Um, they're set due to concerns about climate change, which small island nations um, quite understandably uh, are concerned about. Uh, and uh, those targets, uh, I guess, bolster the position of those countries in climate change negotiations. So, Andrew, given the fact that, as Matthew says, a lot of these nations have quite ambitious targets, uh, whether or not they're, uh, they're set realistically or politically, uh, I guess, is, is another side issue. But given that these targets exist anyway, how committed are energy producers in trying to achieve those renewable energy targets? In, in, um, in, in terms of the targets, I think um, some of the countries will find it uh, quite difficult to, to meet the targets. Uh, as, as Matthew has mentioned, the, the, the options in terms of the renewable energy resources are very limited, in, in, especially in the smaller, um, low-lying uh, uh, countries uh, in the Pacific. Um, for the bigger countries that have um, a number of uh, resources available that, that, can be, um, that can be achieved. Although um, what we're seeing uh, is some of the countries uh, resetting their targets because now there is a lot more work done in, in, in terms of identifying the resources and, and how that can be um, and the various uh, actions that can be taken to achieve the targets. Uh, we, we have seen a number of countries now resetting the targets uh, so that it becomes more achievable um, for, for the country in terms of the renewable energy uh, um, generation. So, in, in terms of developing renewable energy sources in these countries, uh, do you believe that it, it should be the, the government that does this, or the private sector, or, or a combination? I think it's going to be everybody. Um, the customers, um, us, um, one of the stakeholders, they, they can do their part in, in terms of uh, not only taking part in renewable energy uh, generation, but also being conscious and uh, of their of the consumption and, and um, embarking on uh, energy efficiency uh, um, uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, um, the private sector plays a very important role in, 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 in uh, getting um, uh, towards the, the working towards the targets. Uh, and uh, this, this is an area where where a lot of the uh, island countries still need a lot of work to be done in terms of. Uh, the regulatory frameworks and the policies that can enable private sector to participate in, in, in uh, renewable energy generation. Um, remembering that a lot of the utilities, at least in 80% of the utilities in the Pacific, uh, who are members of my uh, organizations are owned by the governments and, and the, the utilities were set up using uh, government legislations that uh, set their uh, uh, roles and, and the responsibilities in, in terms of uh, electricity supply. Okay, so Paul, a as uh, Andrew mentioned, uh, he believes that you need a, a government and a private sector approach to it all, but you're saying that there are many obstacles in place that prevent uh, potential suppliers like yourself from, from entering the Pacific energy market. What can be done, in your view, to encourage people like yourself to, to, um, to develop energy in the region? Well, uh, the targets are very, very important to have an overriding policy position for, for targets. Uh, so that, that aligns everybody right up front that the, the whole idea is to move forwards and, and to reduce um, the use of diesel predominantly. Um, so that, that's extremely important. Um, however, electricity systems evolve 
Um, and it's, it's very hard to make a policy setting, such as a feed-in tariff um, or... Explain, just briefly explain to us what a feed-in okay, tariff is. Okay, a feed-in tariff is just a price that the, that the energy utility or the government guarantees that they will pay for a, for a certain uh, volume of electricity, a certain number of kilowatt hours. Um, it's, it's, it takes a brave person to actually say, okay, you can have you can have X dollars or X cents per, per kilowatt hour, which is the energy unit, for the next 15 years. In the situation where you've got huge price volatility of diesel uh, generation, or also the price of solar panels is coming down dramatically. When's the right time to go, yes, we'll, we'll give that certain price to an, to a, an independent power producer? So that mechanism is very difficult to do. So what, although policy is very, very important, I think it, it also, there's, a, there's a, situ, a, a, a role there for the people running the, to be running the power systems to be empowered to make that decision for themselves where they say, okay, this price that I'm striking today and these terms and conditions of the contract with the independent power producer, I, I, I am happy with that even if the situation arises in three years' time where I might be able to get a, a lower price of energy from a new uh, independent power producer. Someone has to be able to make the decision to strike that contract. Uh, that, that's important. So you're looking for certainty, basically, before you invest? Well, I'm looking for not necessarily certainty. Certainty is not nothing certain. There's, there are, there's all, there are all sorts of risks, the environmental risks, sovereign risk, um, uh, technology risks. So there's nothing certain, but there has to be, the, the uncertainty has to be able to be quantified um, so you know what the downsides are to, to making an, an investment. Okay, so Cam, we've heard about the role of government and the private sector in uh, developing renewables in the region, but what role do uh, development organisations have to play in all this? Yeah, we, we are uh, doing a lot of things on uh, several fronts. Uh, one, one of the things is, as I mentioned, to address the weak planning and implementation capacity. We are assisting client governments with uh, support in terms of building their own capacity, undertaking resource studies. Uh, we are also investing in uh, renewable energy technology to build the confidence and build the capacity of the, the government and the operators of those facilities. Uh, we are working with the donors and other development partners to mobilize finance. Uh, we also work, we can work with the governments to address the issue that uh, Paul raised in terms of creating the regulatory environment to create certainty for the private sector to go and uh, invest uh, in the energy uh, sector. I mean, the amount of capital that is required to meet the uh, energy challenges of the Pacific Island countries is enormous. So it has to be a combination of the government, the private sector, and the development partners to fund those investments. And I think one of the critical factors is to get the enabling framework for the private sector to be able to participate. Uh, we also provide uh, grants where required to, for the investments or concessional loans or, or uh, low, no interest loans. Uh, we have facilities where we can provide guarantees for private sector to participate in these countries, uh, both in terms of guarantees for the credit for the loans and also guaranteeing the PPAs. And uh, the bank also has a facility to assist with dispute resolution should uh, the government or the private sector or any other stakeholder have issues with uh, uh, resolving disputes uh, in, in our client countries. Okay, so it sounds like <coughs> renewable energy sources are really the only way to go for many of these Pacific Island nations who don't have access to, say, gas deposits or oil deposits. So really these countries need to make it work. So b before we move on to questions, can I just ask each of you, uh, do you believe the development of these energy sources in the Pacific <coughs> is uh, on the right track? Is, is it moving forward? 
I'll go first. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think there has been tremendous progress uh, over the last um, decade or so. Uh, there's um, greater acceptance of renewable energy technologies, uh, particularly uh, among power utilities in the region. Uh, I think there's also been regulatory reform uh, to try to address some of those challenges that my other panel members have uh, alluded to. Uh, I do have some concerns, however. Uh, I think that in all of this, uh, energy efficiency um, hasn't been given sufficient attention. Uh, generally, uh, avoided cost of generation uh, is lower than the cost of generation from renewable energy technologies. So, so this is where the, the greatest economic gains can be made. And so uh, I think there's room to move uh, in the energy efficiency space. And that is happening, but I think it has taken some time to develop. Uh, my other concern would be access to uh, electricity. Um, so we live in a region where 70% of Pacific Islanders don't have access to an electricity supply uh, and um, renewable energy can play a, an important role in expanding access to electricity. However, I think often the uh, focus, um, the focus of both governments uh, and of investors has been on providing power to existing <coughs> electricity networks. Uh, and that obviously excludes a large portion of Pacific Islanders. Andrew? Yes, I think there's been a, a lot of uh, progress made uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years. We, we've, as Matt, Matt has Matthias mentioned, there's been a, an acceptance of, of uh, renewable energy and, and the private sector participation uh, from within the utilities. Um, and, and, and the progress we've, uh, we've, we've seen uh, has, has resulted uh, in, in the size of the, the installations, especially in solar um, installations, uh, going from kilowatt size to megawatt size. So th there's been a lot of progress made uh, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, renewable energy, especially in, in, in solar. Um, I think for the, for the utilities, it, it's more, uh, I think their concern would be uh, being able to take that additional generation on board but not have uh, adverse impacts on, on the system performance. That is uh, important for the network operator, and, and, uh, but it can be addressed uh, through uh, uh, current technology and technology that's being researched. Uh, so I think there, there is uh, good progress and uh, it can be done. Paul. Well, I, I think that the last 10 years or so have been very, very exciting, and um, that has been driven by technological change, specifically the cost of solar energy, um, solar photovoltaic panels dropping dramatically. Um, that's causing quite a revolution. It's clearly the case now that solar is, is um, much, much cheaper than, than diesel-fired generation. Even, even That's still the case even though recently diesel prices have dropped dramatically. Um, so that there's clearly an acceptance of renewable energy right throughout the Pacific. The question is now how to maximise, get the most renewable energy there. And there are, there are plenty of technologies that are evolving now that we'll see it become very, very commonplace, um, driven by different, different uh, requirements. So electric vehicles are bringing the cost of battery systems down. Um, there are also uh, wind turbines now that are capable of <coughs> cyclonic, being deployed in cyclonic areas. There are, there are diesel systems that, that are specifically designed for um, high penetration renewable energy, intermittent energy sources. So the diesel systems, which form the backbone of all these generation systems, uh, are now technologically more suitable for accepting the variation of wind and solar energy. So that there are exciting times ahead over the next 10 years and I think the, the, the pace of change will actually ramp up and the benefits will increase more over the next 10 years than they have over the previous 10. Okay, Cam, are you as optimistic? I am. I am very optimistic in terms of where renewable energy is going in the Pacific. The cost of solar pan, uh, PV in particular is falling a win is competitive. Uh, in the Pacific Islands, only two countries have uh, the indigenous fossil fuel resources. 
a couple have uh, hydro resources which is Sorry, used. Which nations are they? Uh, Timor Leste and PNG have uh, fossil fuels. Uh, PNG Solomon's uh, Vanuatu. Uh, uh, sorry, PNG Solomon's in Fiji have uh, hydro resources, and there's some also potential geothermal power available in uh, PNG Solomon's Vanuatu and possibly Fiji as well. So, most of the countries in the Pacific, other than the ones who have hydro, rely on imported diesel fuel. Uh, diesel fuel in the city areas is reasonably well priced, it's not that expensive, but in the outer areas it, the prices are exorbitant. So for the outer islands the only solutions are more or less renewable energy and they are very competitive. Even in the larger islands in the load center where the load centers are bigger, uh, grid connected solar is very competitive with diesel fuel as well. So the future of renewable energy I think is uh, in the Pacific is enormous. And I think if we are going to achieve the access rights that these governments are targeting, we will have to think about different models of uh, meeting this demand, especially in sparsely populated small load centers. And we have some programs already underway that are addressing some of these challenges. Okay, well it sounds like there's quite a positive outlook from each of you here, despite the many obstacles. At this point, let's move on to question time. So um, if anyone in the audience has questions, uh, please raise your hand. We've got questions coming in from overseas now. I might start with a question from Papua New Guinea. Um, this one's uh, directed at the panel. Uh, what type of renewable energy would be best suited to a country like PNG? And, and Cam, you mentioned that PNG was one of the few countries that have a, a fossil fuel source. So, um, so this person's asking, what type of renewable energy would suit PNG? Uh, we are doing some uh, resource mapping in PNG at the moment. Uh, hydro potential is uh, quite significant in PNG, and I think. Uh, uh, depending on what the cost structure works out eventually, that would be a significant potential for PNG, especially uh, given the, the land mass and the size of population that currently does not have electricity. Okay. Do you agree? Is that uh, one solution for PNG? I think uh, PNG is much more well resourced in terms of re uh, renewable energy uh, um, resources than, than the Pacific, uh, rest of the Pacific Island countries. Uh, so uh, I think for PNG, it's, uh, it, it's a case of identifying what's the bl best option for them uh, because they do have, uh, like Kamala just mentioned, hydro, there's uh, geothermal, uh, not, not only potential, but it's already being uh, exploited now. Um, and then you have solar and wind. So PNG has, uh, in terms of renewable energy resources, more um, more options, uh, more options mm -hmm. than, than, like I mentioned earlier, the lower lying coral countries uh, in, in, in the Pacific region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think PNGs are ask, asking for a specific technology or that, that's appropriate for PNG is, is a difficult question because it's, I, what I believe is that every, Every there are different technologies that are suitable for the coastal areas of PNG versus the highlands, uh, remote areas versus areas that have strong uh, interconnected distribution systems, electrical distribution systems. Um, so the, the key thing is to enable whoever in government or in the power authority to enable them to be able to make the decision to implement a project uh, that is beneficial for the community at any level. So it, it, if it's appropriate that a small hydro goes ahead on a network interconnected system and it's really cost effective and evident that that project benefits the community, then there should be a policy or an empowerment of the people to make the decision associated with that project. Um, so that that's the key thing. We should be technology agnostic and pick the right technology for the right right solution. Um, and these are these are all proven technologies. Solar is proven. Wind is proven. The, it's not the technology that's the issue here. In most cases, it's it's um, having the people that feel empowered to make the decision, whether that's from 
and whether that can be achieved from a policy point of view, I'd have to leave it to others in the panel to, to move forwards with. Okay, well, let's move on to a question from Sydney, if we have one. Yes. I guess this is mainly directed at uh, Paul and Matthew. Um, how much impact do you think the current oil glut and the consequent low prices are having on the uh, installation of renewable facilities? And do you think that uh, with the diversity of renewable facilities which are suitable in the Pacific area, that the frequency of extreme weather events uh, brought about by climate change are going to have uh, a higher impact in terms of the damage to these facilities as against centralised uh, diesel generation? I think it has had some impact. Uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, Pacific Island governments were motivated uh, to um, I guess uh, encourage or facilitate the installation of renewable energy when oil prices were high, so back in 2007, 2008, that's really where renewable energy came to the fore. Uh, yeah. Obviously it takes a number of years to, to actually install those systems, to make the appropriate regulatory yeah. reforms and so forth. And what we're now finding in some countries where renewable energy systems have been installed, uh, prices haven't necessarily dropped and, and people are asking, well, why hasn't that occurred? Um, I think it's really important to distinguish between uh, the, the price impact of an investment and the risk impact of an investment. So a big reason for, for, for favouring renewable energy installation as opposed to just putting in a diesel generator is that it reduces that exposure to oil price volatility. Yes, oil prices are low now. In another 10 years, they'll probably be high again. Uh, that's the nature of oil prices. So. Investments in renewables should be understood, I guess, as a risk mitigation mechanism rather than as a guarantee of low prices. I think Andrew is probably a better, better place to, to answer that question than me, but I, I get the feeling that there's a collective memory in the Pacific um, associated with April 2008 when oil prices were triple what they are now, um, and I think that people learnt a very hard lesson there about their vulnerability to, um, to high oil prices. So the incentives uh, to displace oil are very, very much at the forefront of most people's memories and minds. In relation to your question about climate change, um, I think that there isn't, there is, uh, talking about the Pacific, which as we heard earlier covers 15% of the planet. Um, there, there are, it depends which, which island or which nation you're talking about. Um, some are cyclonic, some aren't. Uh, but if you're talking about sort of cyclonic events, then um, those cyclonic events have happened over a very long time, you know, have, have always been there. Um, if climate change increases the severity of those, then that could be problematic to the long-term investment of, of renewables that get damaged by those events. Although they are very, very, um, but they are quite resilient to those events. Okay, I've got a question from Solomon Islands uh, for Andrew. So, renewable energy requires technical capacity. What areas of training would you recommend young Pacific Islanders take in terms of qualifications? For renewable energy, um, there, there has been always training, but there, there are other aspects to renewable energy that I think we, 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 we see the need to, to undertake um, in, for, for different groups. We, we, um, we, we see the need, for example, in, in terms of the, the um, the, the, the uh, policy training in renewable energy. We, we need these people to be able to develop renewable energy policies and um, uh, directions that countries need to, uh, to take on board. Uh, technical training has always been the, uh, in the field of the, the utilities um, and that continues to, to change as technolo technology changes. Um, and also, also in, in terms of uh, the, the financial aspects of being able to determine what is good and, and what, what will work and what will not work for, for, for a particular country in terms of uh, renewable energy training. 
Uh, and and it's, it's encouraging to note that there is that recognition by development partners now, and they're putting um, resources into developing their training within the Pacific through, through the um, European Union funded uh, PACTIVA, uh, also uh, World Bank funding to, 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 to various organizations and other development partners who are not only addressing the technical aspects, but the whole range of uh, skills that uh, is required in, in terms of uh, pushing the renewable energy uh, um, uh, agenda forward. Okay, excellent. Let's go to, um, to the question from Sydney. Um, I'm Laura from Global Voices. Um, and I had a question probably directed to Paul. Um, you talked about needing to be technologically agnostic across this diverse area. I just have a question regarding wave energy for some of the smaller nations. I know it's really new technology in, even in Australia, but is there a potential that that could be harnessed for obviously the nations that have small land mass and potential with oceans there? Thanks for that question, Laura. I, um there's no doubt there's a lot of energy in waves. Um, however, on, on a global scale, there aren't a lot of successful commercial wave energy operations occurring. Um, I think that the technology, even though it's been investigated for over, since the 1960s, is still nascent with very early technology, very, um, and um, I think we have to be careful using early technologies in remote areas um, because I, I just get the feeling that, they're, that, that we don't really want to turn the Pacific into a test bed for these technologies. Um, I think it's better to have a test bed for these technologies that are closer to where they're being developed. However, um, keeping that in mind, uh, a lot of people were very, very cynical about solar and were very cynical about wind and I think that we need to be open-minded about these things but also fully cognizant of the fact that they are very early technology. Um, if, if, I can, if I can just add, <coughs> the, I think in the Pacific we have seen a number of these um, um, cases where uh, new technology has been promoted, uh, technology that hasn't been, hasn't, still hasn't matured. And I, I think um, in, in the Pacific, we do not have the resources to be able to, to operate, maintain, and manage these new technologies. It, it is, if, if it's, um, it, it's unproven technology, and as we've seen in the early stages of solar, we, we've had a lot of failed uh, projects uh, in, in the Pacific. Uh, we, we learn from it, but it's, it's an expensive learning exercise. Um, in, in terms of uh, the Pacific situation, we would look at technology that has matured, is proven, and, and so that we, we have the confidence to be able to operate and maintain. We, we have seen instances where uh, new technology has been floated, but um, I think it, it was used for other purposes rather than um, um, the, the intention that uh, we've been we've been sold. So let, let, let's get it working off the coast of Perth first, <laughs> or off the coast of Port Kembla, um, and let, let's make sure it doesn't sink when it gets towed out to where it's supposed to be moored. Uh, we, we, we're probably quite a few of us are probably aware of many issues associated with wave energy devices in the past. Um, let's just get it working well before we put it into a highly corrosive. Uh, difficult to maintain situation which is exposed to large extreme events in the sea uh, on off the coast of many small Pacific islands I think that's probably the main <laughs> the main we, we're in we're in agreement about wave energy so here. on the side of caution excellent yeah. And now we've got a question from Papua New Guinea. Um, Cam, if I can get you to answer this one. Is there anything that we as individuals can do to increase renewable energy usage? And um, I, I want to put this question to you because you were describing to me some interesting projects that uh, households were doing individually rather than um, electricity suppliers working on a grid. Yeah, I think uh, the, the project I referred to was to meet a special need. I mean, we were looking at uh, remote communities in uh, Vanuatu. 
And uh, the issues there are that there is no technical know-how in these communities. So if you put out technologies that require technicians to install or fix it, it it's not going to work for very long. It's going to fall apart and uh, it'll go into disrepair. So what we've done is we've targeted uh, plug-and-play systems to be deployed by the private sector to the rural co uh, communities where the only thing the householders have to do is change the batteries when they need to be changed. So we are trying to meet a need, taking into account the specific, specific situations of those communities. In terms of what uh, individuals can do to sort of uh, promote renewable energy, I think uh, the first point would be, I think I'd go to uh, one of the comments made earlier, is that individuals can use their energy <coughs> more efficiently. So it's not directly promoting renewable energy, but it's taking the burden of uh, any fossil fuel-based generation or any sort of generation of uh, electricity. <coughs> On the other hand, I think individuals can also become more aware of the little things they can do to improve the way they use the, their energy. Uh, from an investment perspective, uh, I think people should consider what's I the ideal solution for them in terms of using energy. A lot of r rural communities probably only need, at this stage, uh, energy for lighting, perhaps for phone charging, so they can look for solutions that meet their immediate needs and then wait for the bigger developments to come along to give them more horsepower in terms of what they can do with the electricity. Excellent. Do we have another question from Sydney? So. It's uh, Tom McTeer from Siemens. Um, I'm just interested um, in, in terms of the business models for these plants. Um, are there any particular models that, that have more sort of buy-in than others, you know, that are more successful um, based on what has been, been done? For example, an IPP or um, an owner investment, build, own, operate, trans transfer. Um, what sort of appetite is there for these various business models? Yeah. In the islands, most power generation systems, if they're grid-based systems, are operated by either the government or state-owned enterprises. Uh, Vanuatu is one of the countries where private concession holders operate the grid. But I think we are talking about expanding access. So we need to look for solutions where we're talking about small grid systems, where IPPs build on our operate type uh, models would be much better. We don't know how attractive these will be to private investors to build on and operate. What we know though is that uh, if the government or the community owns and operates it, they don't work very effectively because communities do not have the technical know-how or the commercial know to run a power system. So we are just embarking on a couple of programs where we're trying to get the private sector to operate it. And we're looking to cover the viability cap to make it attractive to IPP type arrangements, build on operate, or even the government owns it and the operators are private sector under management contracts. I've got a question here from the World Bank live stream and it's from uh, UTS here in Sydney. Uh, are there countries that are getting the policy conditions right? How have they overcome risks around um, com comparable oil price volatility? So can I put that question to you, Matthew? Are there, are there countries that are getting it right in terms of the, the policy framework? I guess I'd say there's great variation um, between the policy framework of different Pacific Island countries. Uh, some countries are, are far ahead of others. Uh, even countries that, that are way ahead, a country like Fiji, for example, I think still uh, face issues around the attraction of IPPs. Um, so Fiji has established, um, over the last 10 years, uh, has uh, established a, a good uh, independent regulator which um, sets prices for feed-in tariffs, so for the, tar the, price, uh, the payment to independent power producers for actually supplying the grid. Even there, though, uh, Fiji has had real trouble in attracting uh, an independent power producer to produce in the country. Uh, 
there are a range of, of issues, um, lack of clarity around um, dispatch, for example, whether when um, power is no longer required, whether the independent power producer will be uh, the first to go offline and therefore lose that revenue. So it is a very complicated space. Um, I don't think any country can claim to have it completely right, um, and certainly in Australia we don't have it right, uh, but there has been progress made, um, and I think that there's enormous progress that could be made in, in a countries where there still, still hasn't been a great deal of reform, particularly the smaller island nations, which are effectively uh, operating um, government-owned utilities and have done very little to attract private sector investment. So what about outside the Pacific? Is there a country that's navigated this area well, in your view? Um, I mean, I guess the, the history of power sector reform goes back to the 80s. Uh, countries that are frequently highlighted as, as, as um, best practice, uh, um, the UK um, and Chile. Uh, even in those cases, however, there were real issues with the, with the power sector reforms that took place. Um, in both cases, there were improvements in efficiency, uh, reductions in the cost of power that was generated, but then due to inadequate regulation, uh, those uh, cost savings didn't flow to the end user. Um, so even in countries where uh, there has been great um, advances, that there are still issues. Okay, do we have another question in Sydney? Hi, Shonda Phillips from Sydney Uni. Um, I guess this question is for both Andrew and or Matthew. Um, I'm just wondering how the renewable energy sources in Fiji uh, sit in with your agricultural production systems there. So I, I think you've mostly got hydro and um, some biomass as well. I wonder, you know, how, how, the, how you go in terms of competing for resources for ag, ag production. I think in, in Fiji, in terms of the agricultural resources, um, they do have uh, a Fiji Sugar Corporation, which um, sells to the grid during the uh, crushing season, um, as well as uh, uh, tropic woods. Uh, which does um, does uh, um, wood chip uh, um, um, and then and sells to the, to the Fiji Electricity Corporation as well. So uh, those are the two that, that I'm aware of. But there there are currently there is currently a, a um, um, work underway on a, on a biomass plant, uh, uh, which is looking at 20 megawatts. So. It, it, it is going to uh, contribute significantly to the uh, generation mix in Fiji. Um, and, and I think there is potential for more with Fiji being, uh, uh, having a lot more options in terms of the, the in terms of renewable energy resources uh, uh, with, within, within, uh, within the Fiji group. Not, not, not only in, on, on VT level, but also in Vanua level as well. Those are also the examples that I'm aware of. Um, the Fiji economy is often compared to the economy of Mauritius, um, and uh, Mauritius has been very successful. And I think this is an area where Mauritius also has been quite successful. That's um, in uh, co-generation from the sugar milling industry. Uh, so one of the issues that um, the Fiji Sugar Corporation faces is that it has these plants, but they often don't produce. So when sugar isn't being processed, uh, they're not producing power. Uh, in Mauritius, they actually import coal and they use that in the off season. So it's not particular; it's not a renewable energy resource, obviously, and it can be criticised on environmental grounds. Uh, but that, uh, from a financial perspective, is the most efficient um, option. So I, I agree with Paul's earlier comment about uh, needing to remain um, and uh, technology agnostic. I think it's it's really important to to um, weigh your options um, on a case by case basis. Do we have another question from Sydney? Earlier this year we had Cyclone Pam in Vanuatu with winds of up to 420 kilometres an hour at one point. Now that's beyond the scale. Eh? That's above a level five. There are actually officially no levels above a five. But that's actually a level six. What happened was the Digicel telef mobile phone telephone network throughout the whole country broke down. Uh, almost the whole country was silent for a while, for three or four or five days or so. Um, it turns out that it looks as if all their towers had only been built very rapidly, very well, but only to stand a level three cyclone. What we found was that trying to communicate with people in the outer islands after that was almost impossible for up to 
as much as two months after the cyclone in some more remote areas. But we finally managed to get through to them, not on the new Digicel network, but the old-fashioned old fashioned government network where the towers had been built much more expensively and very slowly, but were built l like concrete bunkhouses. And they were still working. I think uh, Vanuatu was a good example, actually. Uh, there's also uh, a good example of building resilience in the way the renewable energy installations are built. The wind turbines in Vanuatu can be taken down. So during the cyclone period, they were basically pulled down to the ground to protect them from the wind. And uh, so far as uh, funding uh, organizations to build resilience, I mean, all the con uh, projects that uh, uh, development banks like ourselves, IDB and others do is we have we carefully consider including building resilience into all the projects we do. So we take considerations of natural disasters, disasters and other factors into account when the projects are being designed. Okay, oh, we're <coughs> almost coming to a close, but we have a question here from Solomon Islands from the uh, Hatonga Group. Given the location of PNG and their LNG, should we be looking towards LNG as an alternate energy source in the Pacific? So not clearly not a renewable energy source, but uh, one that's quite abundant in that region. Sh should that be considered as being distributed more widely? That, that is an interesting question and, and one which um, the World Bank together with the Pacific Power Association and SPC have uh, explored through a, a, a study that um, is with, with the report to be released soon. Lo looking at what other options do we have in terms of uh, um, energy for electricity generation and uh, although LNG is not um, renewable. It's, it's much cleaner than, than uh, diesel. And um, I, I think um, whether we can access from PNG is, is something um, that, that uh, PNG and the developers are, uh, can, can um, uh, only they can answer that question. But uh, if, if, it's an, uh, if it's a resource that's available, uh, available readily, cheaply to the Pacific Islands. I'm, I'm sure um, the, the bigger utilities would certainly look at that. Interesting. And we have time for just one more question uh, from Sydney. If there's a lucky last one. Hi. Chloe Hicks from the New South Wales Government. I have a question and it could be for anyone on the panel. What role do you see energy storage and particularly battery technologies playing in sort of enabling renewable energy in the Pacific? Yes, the storage issue that, um, is, uh, that much of the world is grappling with in terms of renewable energy. I think for the Pacific Islands it would be a major game changer. I think not only for the Pacific Islands but for, for the electric utilities as well. For the Pacific Islands it, it will bring them closer to uh, being able to achieve that 100% renewable energy um, uh, target. Um, uh, for the electricity utilities it, it, it is a new a whole new ball game altogether because they will have to change the, the way they see customers whether they are they customers or are they um, um, generation source uh, so it, it is going to be uh, quite a, uh, going to have quite a significant impact on on, on energy uh, electricity as a whole yeah. I, I see it as a game changer um, it's for especially for customers um, Customers on, on networks at the moment can uh, they might install a certain amount of, of solar, for instance, and they'll only install the amount of solar that meets their their their, their maximum demand or their the, the maximum uh, magnitude of energy that they're using because they don't want to export it. Quite often in the Pacific Islands, they don't get uh, compensated for the energy that they export to the network. Um, as soon as there is a cost-effective storage system, um, they, that situation will change and it might enable them to put in three or four times as much solar as they do at the moment. And, uh, and when that starts to happen, it'll make the networks 
more difficult to operate cost effectively because they won't be selling enough volume down their networks, they won't get compensated for the network. So there has to be, it, it's going to require, in Australia or in the Pacific Islands, it's going to require, um, or any other country in fact, if storage becomes cheap, it's going to be, um, it's going to require different policy and different methodologies for recovering costs to enable the the shared assets that we that the people who are connected to a distribution system, the poles and wires, they have to be paid for by somebody. Um, so, so so storage could actually be problematic for for the networks. But um, great news for renewable energy. Yeah, I think uh, for the Pacific Islands, uh, this storage is a necessity. Uh, solar energy is intermittent. You only have it during the day. So if you want to use it at any other time, you need to store it. Also, I think as the panelists have alluded to, if you there is a limit to how much intermittent generation you can put into a grid. If you have storage, you can increase the amount of renewable energy that you can also put into the grid as well. So hopefully, with the cost going down, it will become a game changer, as the panelists are saying, for, for the Pacific. And I'd, I'd just add, I think, um, as Paul has said, it, it would be a, a game changer for utilities. But I think what makes the Pacific unique to many other parts of the world is that um, in parts of Europe, for example, where you have very high levels of wind energy penetration. Uh, when the wind stops blowing, they can actually import electricity from other countries, and that occurs on a regular basis. In the Pacific, you, you can't have that. And that means that those 100% renewable energy targets uh, are much more costly to achieve because you have to invest in storage, which currently um, is very expensive. So when the price of storage drops, it will be a real game changer for the region. Back. One more. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Batteries also, even even in a pure diesel system, can can uh, add flexibility to the network. <clears throat> they can. I've been told not to get too technical, but what they can do is uh, they can they can change the way that a diesel the, the the number of diesel engines are bought online. So you don't have to have reserve capacity for large changes in the load. On the, on the system. So batteries can really, really help with efficiencies on the network. It, it all comes down to, to the cost of those batteries. And at the moment, um, those battery costs are still too high. They're just, it, it's not, not yet cost effective without um, donor funds, for instance. To, to watch to, this space. To watch this space, that's, that's great. And of course, we, we've probably all heard about Tesla and Panasonic and Samsung, they're all putting in massive battery factories. BYD is another one. Um, so it, it's, there's a real revolution going on in the battery space at the moment. Excellent. Well, on that note, that brings us to the end of our discussion. Can we please thank our panellists, Kamleshwar Kelawan, Paul Fulton, Andrew Ducker and Matthew Dornan. I'd also like to thank everyone joining us either here in Sydney or from afar. And remember, you can view this or any of the other Praxis discussions at worldbank.org slash Praxis. Until next time, I'm Oscar Savakti. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now.